So in this tutorial, we're going to pick up where we left off in the last one. Uh, with our facing toolpath complete, we're going to move on to our contour toolpath. Now contour is most used for following the profile of an object in order to cut the walls of it. In this case, we'll use it to machine the outer edge of our object here. So I'm going to go to the toolpaths tab and select contour. Now for this toolpath, we will need to chain the boundary we want to cut. If you remember our chaining direction and side tutorial, uh, it's important that we select the chain in the correct direction in order to climb mill. So if I select over here on this bottom chain, the arrow will face to the left, which means that the tool will cut to the left. Now a right hand tool cutting, uh, turning, rotating in a clockwise direction cutting to the left of an external feature like this would result in a climb milling um, direction of cut. So that is what we want. So I'm going to select this side of the line with full chaining enabled, this first option here. By clicking here you'll see the arrow is selected. I'm going to say OK. And you'll notice that we're presented with a very similar dialog box to the facing one. I'm going to move down to the tool tab. We'll, we'll try not to spend as much time on this tutorial as we did on the last one. We'll move things along a little faster. We're going to select library tool like before. We're going to go to the filter. In filter here, we're going to select the type of tool we want. Now I'm after an end mill, specifically a flat end mill. So I'm going to select the flat end mill button, the very first one, and we have quite a good selection here to pick from. Now I know that my stock is five inches by five inches, and it's just about, yeah, it's exactly an inch thick. So we don't need anything too crazy here, but we are machining the outside of a part, so we can use a pretty hefty tool to cut off the material quickly. Even up to a one inch end mill would be very feasible here. So let's, let's use a one inch end mill. So I'm gonna select that. Now we can push a one inch end mill pretty good through aluminum, and we're only gonna be taking a pretty minimal cut, being that we wanna just remove the excess stock around the edge which is only uh, about an eighth on each side, an eighth of an inch that is. So let's uh, do a spindle speed of about uh, 2000 and a feed rate of about uh, 25. That should be pretty good. Plunge rate can usually match your feed rate. You could, you could crank the plunge rate up a lot higher, but uh, just for, for uh, peace of mind, we'll keep it about the same. Uh, we can also enable rapid retract. That's usually a nice thing to have on. There's a few scenarios where you might not want that, but rapid retract basically allows uh, when the part when the tool is retracting to leave a cut, it will allow the machine to do that in a rapid motion uh, to get out uh, f as fast as possible. Uh, moving on to cut parameters, uh, we do want to do a 2D contour. So the options here that we use commonly would be 2D or 2D chamfer. A 2D chamfer contour would be used for creating chamfers on edges with a chamfer mill, uh, which we will talk about in, in, a, in a future part of the course. But for now, we will just look at uh, 2D. Uh, compensation direction is set to left. That is uh, indeed what we want. We want the material to the left of the cutter, uh, or rather, sorry, the cutter to the left of the material, I mean. Um, in this case, which is what it is. Uh, looking down here a little bit, not too much we need to change really here. Uh, we, you can see that we have the option to leave stock on the walls or floors. Floors aren't really applicable here, but we could leave stock on the wall if we wanted. Again, this would be relevant if we needed to come back in and do a finishing operation later. But for what we're doing, we there's no re reason to do that. Um, we're only cutting a very small amount. It's easy to get a good finish in uh, aluminum like this, so not too worried. Depth cuts is another thing. If we had a reason to take this cut in multiple steps, we could do that here. But again, the part's only about an inch thick, and uh, it's a very minimal cut, so we'll just take it in one depth. Lead in, lead out is a uh, relatively frequently reoccurring uh, feature. What it allows us to do is to adjust how the tool comes into the material and how it leaves the material. Now it does this by default in a nice arcing motion to reduce uh, impact of the cutter hitting the side of the material. Uh, while this is useful, the amount that it leads in is usually a little bit excessive. Uh, you'll notice that it's trying to lead in on a one inch arc 
radius, um, or sorry, a one inch uh, length of lead in, and a one inch arc radius as well. Now I'm going to reduce the arc radius here to be about 50% of this, and the length is to be about 50% as well. Uh, this will save us a little bit of time on our lead ins, lead outs. Uh, another quick note here this is, the left side here is our lead in, right side is our lead out. If we use this little button right here, it copies across whatever settings we set on one side to the other side. So you'll see quickly the length and radius over here also jumped to 50%. We could reduce these values even further to save a little bit more time, but we'll leave them at this value for now as it's generally pretty safe. Breakthrough. Uh, this is something that's useful when we're doing a full cut right through an object or around the outside of an object. Now it's important to note that if we are this would be a good example of process planning, thinking ahead to how this part needs to be held. If this is a block being held in a, a uh, in a vise, we need to consider that we may not be able to cut a full inch down or we risk hitting the vise that's holding this material. Unless of course we have an additional perhaps uh, a few hundred thou on the bottom here that we haven't represented in our drawing that's going to be used for work holding. For the case of this part we're going to assume that that is actually the case that there is some amount of material below this that is being held in a vise and that we're just not going to model that portion of the material which is no problem. So we're going to assume we have the, the finished product needs to be a full inch and that we have a little bit of clearance past that. So being that we have a little bit of clearance Typically, if we're machining a part that's um, going to be shorter than the stock we're working with, we would want to machine slightly past our desired depth so that when we flip the part over to, comp to finish it, whether that's by facing it down to size or whatever the case may be, um, we want to have that little bit of clearance so that we uh, for sure have enough uh, finished surface on the outside. So enabling breakthroughs is a good way to do that because this allows you uh, breakthrough is used in addition to the depth of cut you set. So if I set a one inch depth of cut and enable breakthrough for say, you don't need to use very much, even just like 10 thou is probably plenty. Just a little bit to go past your desired depth so that you can ensure a good finish all the way around. So I can enable 10 thou of breakthrough and then in my, uh, again, so we'll get to the linking parameters in a second, but just on our way there, Multi-passes allows you to take multiple cuts so that you can take less with each cut. Again, in the case of what we're doing, this is completely unnecessary as we're taking a very light cut to begin with. Tabs we're not going to talk about. Um, it specifically relates to cutting out material with, uh, without letting it uh, drop down. This would be, especially if we were cutting uh, something out of a plate, perhaps a repeating pattern out of a plate several times. We don't want the piece, individual pieces getting caught on the cutter or falling down into the machine. You can arrange to have tabs positioned in key places to hold the pieces up and then to break the tabs off later. Uh, that is what this is for, but we won't be using it at all. Linking parameters. So you'll notice that a number of these settings have carried over from our original toolpath. That is due to the fact that when we started this program, we went to the tool settings and enabled modal values. That is what this affects. So you'll notice our clearance stayed the same here. Our retract stayed the same, feed plane same, all of that. Now quick note here, top of stock still says 50 thou. Now we faced off that 50 thou in the previous operation. So we can actually disable this now because this has been removed. So it's better to tell it that the top of stock is now zero because that is indeed what it is. If we did not do this, the, the cutter would try to start cutting higher than necessary, wasting time on our cuts. Next up here we need to set our depth. Now I'm going to set the depth, as I said, to one inch. Now keep in mind, we are talking about one inch below the z-axis, so this does need to be a negative one inch. We want to cut to negative one inch, and this is an absolute value. Exactly negative one inch in z. Okay. Finally, we're going to turn on coolant. Again, we'll go to the coolant section and we'll turn on coolant flood. And we'll press OK. Now you'll see after doing that, that if I go to a front view and I zoom in a little bit, you can see that we are indeed, this blue line representing the cut position of our cutter 
is indeed just below our our, our laid out stock. This is that 10 thou breakthrough we set up so that we told it to cut to this red line, but then in the in that other screen we told it we wanted a 10 thou breakthrough, or in this case a 10 thou additional depth of cut, so that we can ensure we get the finished size we want all the way around the part. So we can see that this uh, toolpath is cutting on the correct side, it is cutting on the outside of the part, not the inside, and it's going to come in on the green, cut around like this, all the way around the part, and come back out on the red. This is exactly what we want, and this is a good conclusion to our contour toolpath tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to look at a drill toolpath. In order to drill a feature, we're going to need somewhere to start with. We could either create a, a point to drill on or a circle. I'm going to create a circle. In the wireframe tab, I'm going to select circle center point, and I'm just going to create a circle in some relatively arbitrary place at the top here. I am going to make it a specific size. We're going to make it a di diameter of half an inch, so it's a half inch circle. And perhaps we'll create two of them, one in each of the top corners. Okay, I will thicken up these lines so they're a little easier to see. And we will go now to the Toolpaths tab and select Drill. Now the Drill Selection menu is a little different than the standard Toolpath Selection menu. Basically all we need to select here is the points of the holes we want to cut. So I'm going to come over here and just simply select somewhere on the outside of each of these circles. Now, be careful here a little bit because if you do have quadrant selection on for auto cursor, which I typically do have enabled, you don't want to accidentally select a quadrant. You want to select the center of your circles. You can do this either by clicking right on the center or by clicking somewhere on the outside edge that is not a quadrant. So for example, I can click right here and you'll notice it creates the center point in the middle of the circle. Alternatively, I can click right on the center to achieve the same result. You'll notice that it's linked these two circles together. This is representing that these will both be cut by the same toolpath, starting here, and then moving to here. I can now press the OK button. Now we're presented with the standard uh, toolpath settings here. So I'm going to come to the tool menu first thing, and we're going to select a drill. Select library tool. Now I Remember, we created those holes at half an inch in size. So what I'm going to do is just watch this diameter column right here, and I'm going to scroll down looking for a half inch. So I'm getting closer, getting closer, getting closer, and here we go. Half inch, half inch drill, tool 162. I'm going to press OK. You'll notice as it gets imported, it does get assigned a new number sequentially, so it's now tool 3 in this program. Um, and I didn't add a comment in the last toolpath, but uh, I, I can add a comment here. Uh, this is to drill the two top holes, so I will say drill uh, the two holes. In this case, there are only two, so that's a sufficient description. Um, generally with drilling, I like to be a little conservative. It's easy to adjust your, your tool speed when you're at the machine. Um, I will put this to probably about a thousand RPM, it's probably fine, maybe about five inches a minute. A little bit slow, really, but uh, I guess we could do maybe like more like 10, it's probably a little better. Um, I don't typically push drills too crazy from here because I like to see how they actually work on the machine and perhaps what length of drill we're using, how rigid it is, if it's high speed steel or carbide, that kind of thing. So this is fine for now. I'm going to come down here to, uh, we don't need to use the stock menu. Uh, cut parameters. Uh, drilling toolpaths are very simple. Basically, we're just going to come to cut parameters and tell it what kind of cut we want to make. So here we have a number of options. I can choose uh, dr drill counter bore as your standard one single cut from top to bottom of a hole at a steady speed. Peck drilling, of course, you can come down in small increments coming back out of the hole every time to clear chips. Chip break drills in one motion, but but periodically stops temporarily, just slightly shifting the cutter so as to snap a chip but not pull the cutter out of the hole. And then of course we also have, have rigid tapping and a few other, uh, or rather standard tapping and rigid tapping down here, and a few other uh, standard options here. Uh, of course, uh, for, so for this cut, 
Um, we're just going to be drilling through one inch aluminum, a uh, half inch drill. Um, I'm probably just going to do it in a standard drill counterbore cycle. It should be fine. It's not uh, too hefty of a cut, really. Uh, we aren't pushing it too hard. Really, that's mostly all we have to adjust here. We're going to come to the linking parameters and just tell it the depth of cut we need. Uh, I am going, going to tell it that it's negative one inches for the cut. That is an absolute measurement. Uh, top of stock is absolute zero. And we do want a clearance of about an inch. That will also be an absolute value. Uh, retract height of half an inch is fine. Again, also absolute. Um, one other quick note that is very useful is the tip comp section. So I'm going to come down to tip comp and explain what that does. So keep in mind, we've set our depth to be negative one inch. If I come down to tip comp, what this does, if I'm going to enable it, basically what this does, because Mastercam has all of its tool definitions built into the program, what it can do is it knows, when I select a half inch drill, it knows exactly how much of that drill is the uh, pointed tip portion. The reason that's important is that when we set a depth in Mastercam of one inch, it, it's calculating one inch to the tip of the drill. However, you'll notice because a drill is tapered on the end, if you cut to one inch deep from the tip, you're not going to get a truly one inch hole because it's going to fall back on this edge and it's not going to completely clear out your hole. So in our case, by enabling tip comp, what it's going to do is it's going it's calculated right here. You can see it's already determined the value of how uh, much length is lost by the tip, and it's compensating that much on top of our depth so that we get a truly one inch deep hole to full diameter. Additionally to that, you can add in a breakthrough amount, just like we did with our end mill, to just push it past the bottom layer just a little bit of extra so that we do have that clearance. So 10 thou is plenty. This is perfect. We'll leave it exactly like this. We'll come down and turn on coolant as our last step. Coolant flood on. OK. If we rotate our view, you'll now notice we do have our drilling cycle come down, drill the first hole, come up, over, drill our second hole, and done. Let's discuss tool creation within Mastercam briefly. Now Mastercam has a pretty extensive library of tools by default and you can easily import additional tool libraries into Mastercam for use with the software. However, from time to time we'll, we will find that we need to have a tool that's not at, at our disposal currently. Uh, when this happens, uh, I'm going to quickly pull up a menu here so that you can follow along with me. I'm just going to open a contour operation again. Again, the type of operation doesn't really matter. Our goal is to just get to the tool screen. Once here, you can right click anywhere in this white space and you can select create tool. Now, before we do that though, let's look at select library tool for a moment. And again, this and this is where you'll come to select all of your tools uh, tooling for Mastercam. Again, just to step through that, you can either, either select select library tool right here or right click and select it here. Once you have selected that, you'll notice it's already brought up some suggestion, suggestions by default for tooling. Um, I don't want a spot drill though, so I'm going to come over here to the filter button and from filter I can select what type of tooling I'm looking for. Now many of these tooling types are filled out quite well in Mastercam. End mills, sphere end mills, bull end mills, face mills, the list goes on. Most of these categories are quite extensive. However, there are some categories with no entries. One example of this is the dove mill or the dovetail cutter. There are no dovetail cutters by default programmed into uh, Mastercam, at least for the metric template that we're working with. These tooling uh, libraries are dependent on whether we're working in Imperial or metric. Additionally to no dovetails, we also don't get any slot mills or woodruff cutters. Now this is um, a little bit problematic because if, say for example, we need to cut a slot around the z-axis uh, z-axis of our um, our part, then we can't really do that with a three-axis machine without a Woodruff cutter uh, or other specialized tooling. So in the case like this, we may need to create a new tool. To create a tool, we're going to right-click in this white space and say create tool. Once we do that, we can tell Mastercam what type of tool we want to create. 
we can cr choose one of its templates or create a custom tool. We're going to create a slot mill. Now again worth noting any tooling we create if we are planning to actually machine this part on a physical machine we need to ensure that whatever tooling we create we actually have at our disposal at, our, at the shop in question. Um, oftentimes if we're at a large enough shop we have probably a good deal of tooling at our disposal but other times we may have to deal with pretty specialized situations so it's good to ensure that we do have um, what we need. So let's continue with a slot mill creation. I'm going to hit next and you'll notice immediately here we're presented with some settings. This isn't a super complicated screen it's actually pretty straightforward. The things we get to adjust are right here. We can choose the cutting diameter of our slot mill. So, for example, we could make it uh, 30 millimeters, let's say. We can choose the overall length of our tool. That's from end of cutter to top of um, the shaft. So I can choose, perhaps this is a, let's say this is an extended neck here so that we can reach further down. So we'll do 80 millimeters. Thickness is the thickness of the cutter itself. So this would be dependent on the thickness of the slot we're trying to cut. So maybe I need it to be 10 millimeters. And then you also have some options regarding the, the profile of the tool. We can choose whether we want to have um, a chamfered edge on our cutter, a radius edge, or a straight square edge. In this case, we'll use a straight edge as an example. Additionally, we can set the shank diameter of our tool in order to um, accommodate if we were going to customize our work holding or tool holding as well which is also something you can do. Uh, finally there is a shoulder length that you can adjust as well but we don't need to do that here. After selecting all these settings we can click next again and now we're presented with this slightly more complicated looking screen but don't worry too much there's not usually a whole lot we need to change here. This is just the system defaults especially if we were to save this tool for future use we might want to put in some defaults here for it to load from. Uh, you can choose what the tool is made of whether it's carbide, ceramic, or H, uh, high speed steel or uh, any of these other ones. Uh, we can also choose the default spindle speed that we feel this tool should run at, uh, default retract rate, plunge rate, etc. All these settings can be adjusted. We can also adjust the name of the tool um, being that I did adjust this to be a um, 30 millimeter diameter and 10 millimeter thick tool, we could identify that here. We could say 30 millimeter by 10 millimeter woodruff or whatever we think appropriate. And then we can say finish. When we do that, you'll notice our tool is now populated into our, our tool list here. It's automatically assigned a number, and the uh, name of the tool is showing here. Now, once we've done that, no matter what we set the defaults to be, we can always adjust our feeds and speeds right here above the comment section.